Sviatoslav I of Kiev, Sviatoslav I. Igorovich, Old East Slavic, Slash, Svendoslavu, Svantoslavu Igorovici, Old Norse, Svindled Ingversen, circa 942 to 26th March 972. Also spelled Sviatoslav was a Grand Prince of Kiev famous for his persistent campaigns in the East and South, which precipitated the collapse of two great powers of Eastern Europe, Khazaria and the First Bulgarian Empire. He also conquered numerous East Slavic tribes, defeated the Alans and attacked both the Bulgars, and at times was allied with the Pechenegs and Magyars. His decade-long reign over the Kievan Rus was marked by rapid expansion into the Volga River Valley, the Pontic Steppe and the Balkans stopped by the end of his short life, Sviatoslav carved out for himself the largest state in Europe, eventually moving his capital in 969 from Kiev, modern-day Ukraine to Pereyaslavets, identified as the modern village of Nufaru, Romania, on the Danube. In contrast with his mother's conversion to Christianity, Sviatoslav remained a staunch pagan all of his life. Due to his abrupt death in ambush, his conquests, for the most part, were not consolidated into a functioning empire, while his failure to establish a stable succession led to a fratricidal feud among his three sons, resulting in two of them being killed. The primary chronicle records Sviatoslav as the first ruler of the Kievan Rus with the name of Slavic origin, as opposed to his predecessors, whose names had Old Norse forms. The name Sviatoslav, however, is not recorded in other medieval Slavic countries. Nevertheless, Spinold is the Old East Norse cognate with the Slavic form as attested in the Old East Norse patronymic of Sviatoslav's son Vladimir, Valdemar Svinoldson. This patronymic naming convention continues in Icelandic and in East Slavic languages. Even in Rus, it was attested only among the members of the House of Rurik, as were the names of Sviatoslav's immediate successors, Vladimir, Yaroslav, and Mstislav. Some scholars see the name of Sviatoslav, composed of the Slavic roots for holy and glory as an artificial derivation combining the names of his predecessors Oleg and Rurik, whose names mean holy and glorious in Old Norse, respectively. Virtually nothing is known about Sviatoslav's childhood and youth, which he spent reigning in Novgorod. Sviatoslav's father, Igor, was killed by the Drevlians around 945, and his mother, Olga, ruled as regent in Kiev until Sviatoslav reached maturity, ca. 963. Sviatoslav was tutored by a Varangian named as Mud. The tradition of employing Varangian tutors for the sons of ruling princes survived well into the 11th century. Sviatoslav appears to have had little patience for administration. His life was spent with his Druzina, roughly, company, in permanent warfare against neighboring states. According to the primary chronicle, he carried on his expeditions neither wagons nor kettles, and he boiled no meat, rather cutting off small strips of horse flesh, game, or beef to eat after roasting it on the coals. Nor did he have a tent, rather spreading out a horse blanket under him and setting his saddle under his head, and all his retinue did likewise. Sviatoslav's appearance has been described very clearly by Leo the Deacon, who himself attended the meeting of Sviatoslav with John Itzimisk. Following Deacon's memories, Sviatoslav was a bright eyed, man of average height but of stalwart build, much more sturdy than Tsimisk. He had bald head and a wispy beard and wore a bushy mustache and a sidelock as a sign of his nobility. He preferred to dress in white, and it was noted that these garments were much cleaner than those of his men, although he had a lot in common with his warriors. He wore a single large gold earring bearing a carbuncle and two pearls. Sviatoslav's mother, Olga, converted to Eastern Orthodox Christianity at the court of Byzantine Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus in 957 at the approximate age of 67. However, Sviatoslav remained a pagan all of his life. In the Treaty of 971 between Sviatoslav and the Byzantine Emperor John Itzimisk, the Rus are swearing by Perun and Belus. According to the primary chronicle, he believed that his warriors, Druzina, would lose respect for him and mock him if he became a Christian. The allegiance of his warriors was of paramount importance in his conquest of an empire that stretched from the Volgato the Danube. Very little is known of Sviatoslav's family life. It is possible that he was not the only, or the eldest, son of his parents. The Russo Byzantine Treaty of 945 mentions a certain Predslava, Volodislav's wife, as the noblest of the Rus women after Olga. The fact that Predslava was Oleg's mother is presented by Vasily Tatishchev. 
He also speculated that Predslava was of a Hungarian nobility. George Vernadsky was among many historians to speculate that Volodislav was Igor's eldest son and heir who died at some point during Olga's regency. Another chronicle told that Oleg, 944, was the eldest son of Igor. At the time of Igor's death, Sviatoslav was still a child, and he was raised by his mother or under her instructions. Her influence, however, did not extend to his religious observance. Sviatoslav had several children but the origin of his wives is not specified in the chronicle. By his wives, he had Yeripok and Oleg. By Malusha, a woman of indeterminate origins, Sviatoslav had Vladimir, who would ultimately break with his father's paganism and convert Rus to Christianity. John Skylights has reported that Vladimir had a brother named Sphingus, whether this Sphingus was a son of Sviatoslav, a son of Malusha by a prior or subsequent husband, or an unrelated Rus nobleman is unclear. Shortly after his accession to the throne, Sviatoslav began campaigning to expand Rus' control over the Volga Valley and the Pontic Steppe region. His greatest success was the conquest of Khazaria, which for centuries had been one of the strongest states of Eastern Europe. The sources are not clear about the roots of the conflict between Khazaria and Rus, so several possibilities have been suggested. The Rus had an interest in removing the Khazar hold on the Volga trade route because the Khazars collected duties from the goods transported by the Volga. Historians have suggested that the Byzantine Empire may have incited the Rus against the Khazars, who fell out with the Byzantines after the persecutions of the Jews in the reign of Roman Asilekapinus. Sviatoslav began by rallying the East Slavic vassal tribes of the Khazars to his cause. Those who would not join him, such as the Viatiques, were attacked and forced to pay tribute to the Kievan Rus rather than to the Khazars. According to a legend recorded in the Primary Chronicle, Sviatoslav sent a message to the Vyatish rulers, consisting of a single phrase, I want to come at you. Old East Slavic, this phrase is used in modern Russian, usually misquoted as, and in modern Ukrainian, to denote an unequivocal declaration of one's intentions. Proceeding by the Oka and Volga rivers, he attacked Volga Bulgaria. He employed Ogas and Pekinek mercenaries in this campaign, perhaps to counter the superior cavalry of the Khazars and Bulgars. Sviatoslav destroyed the Khazar city of Sarkal around 965, possibly sacking, but not occupying, the Khazar city of Kerch on the Crimea as well. At Sarkal, he established a Rus settlement called Belaya Vyaza, the White Tower or the White Fortress, the East Slavic translation for Sarkal. He subsequently destroyed the Khazar capital of Atil. A visitor to Atil wrote soon after Sviatoslav's campaign, the Rus attacked, and no grape or raisin remained, not a leaf on a branch. The exact chronology of his Khazar campaign is uncertain and disputed, for example, Mikhail Artemanov and David Christian proposed that the sack of Sarkal came after the destruction of Atil. Although Ibn Halkal reports the sack of Samander by Sviatoslav, the Rus leader did not bother to occupy the Khazar heartlands north of the Caucasus Mountains permanently. On his way back to Kiev, Sviatoslav chose to strike against the Ossetians and force them into subservience. Therefore, Khazar successor statelets continued their precarious existence in the region. The destruction of Khazar imperial power paved the way for Kievan Rus to dominate north south trade routes through the steppe and across the Black Sea, routes that formerly had been a major source of revenue for the Khazars. Moreover, Sviatoslav's campaigns led to increased Slavic settlement in the region of the Saltovo Mayaki culture greatly changing the demographics and culture of the transitional area between the forest and the steppe. The annihilation of Khazaria was undertaken against the background of the Rus-Byzantine alliance, concluded in the wake of Igor's Byzantine campaign in 944. Close military ties between the Rus and Byzantium are illustrated by the fact, reported by John Skylights's, that a Rus detachment accompanied Byzantine Emperor Nikephoros Phokas in his victorious naval expedition to Crete. In 967 or 968, Nikephoros sent to Sviatoslav his agent, Kalakiros, with the task of talking Sviatoslav into assisting him in a war against Bulgaria. Sviatoslav was paid 15,000 pounds of gold and set sail with an army of 60,000 men, including thousands of Pekineg mercenaries. Sviatoslav defeated the Bulgarian ruler Boris II and proceeded to occupy the whole of northern Bulgaria. Meanwhile, the Byzantines bribed the Pechenegs to attack and besiege Kiev, where Olga stayed with Sviatoslav's son Vladimir. The siege was relieved by the Druzina of Pretish, and immediately following the Pechenegs' retreat, Olga sent a reproachful letter to Sviatoslav. He promptly returned and defeated the Pechenegs, who continued to threaten Kiev.
Sviatoslav refused to turn his Balkan conquests over to the Byzantines, and the parties fell out as a result. To the chagrin of his boy Ars and his mother, who did within three days after learning about his decision, Sviatoslav decided to move his capital to Pereyaslavets in the mouth of the Danube due to the great potential of that location as a commercial hub. In the primary chronicle record for 969, Sviatoslav explains that it is to Pereyaslavets, the center of his lands, all the riches flow, gold, silks, wine, and various fruits from Greece, silver and horses from Hungary and Bohemia, and from Rus furs, wax, honey, and slaves. In summer 969, Sviatoslav left Rus again, dividing his dominion into three parts, each under a nominal rule of one of his sons. At the head of an army that included Pekinek and Magyar auxiliary troops, he invaded Bulgaria again, devastating Thrace, capturing the city of Philippopolis, and massacring its inhabitants. Nikephoros responded by repairing the defenses of Constantinople and raising new squadrons of armored cavalry. In the midst of his preparations, Nikephoros was overthrown and killed by John Tsimisks, who thus became the new Byzantine emperor. John Tsimisks first attempted to persuade Sviatoslav into leaving Bulgaria, but he was unsuccessful. Challenging the Byzantine authority, Sviatoslav crossed the Danube and laid siege to Adrianople causing panic on the streets of Constantinople in summer 970. Later that year, the Byzantines launched a counter-offensive. Being occupied with suppressing a revolt of Bardas Phokas in Asia Minor, John Tsimisk sent these commander-in-chief, Bardas Skleros, who defeated the coalition of Rus, Pechenegs, Magyars, and Bulgarians in the Battle of Arcadiopolis. Meanwhile, John, having quelled the revolt of Bardas Phokas, came to the Balkans with a large army and promoting himself as the liberator of Bulgaria from Sviatoslav, penetrated the impracticable mountain passes and shortly thereafter captured Martianopolis, where the Rus were holding a number of Bulgar princes hostage. Sviatoslav retreated to Doristalan, which the Byzantine armies besieged for 65 days. Cut off and surrounded, Sviatoslav came to terms with John and agreed to abandon the Balkans, renounce his claims to the southern Crimea, and return west of the Dnieper River. In return, the Byzantine emperor supplied the Rus with food and safe passage home. Sviatoslav and his men set sail and landed on Verze Island at the mouth of the Dnieper, where they made camp for the winter. Several months later, their camp was devastated by famine, so that even a horse's head could not be bought for less than a half grivna, reports the Kievan chronicler of the primary chronicle. While Sviatoslav's campaign brought no tangible results for the Rus, it weakened the Bulgarian statehood and left it vulnerable to the attacks of Basil the Bulgar slayer four decades later. Fearing that the peace with Sviatoslav would not endure, the Byzantine emperor induced the Pekineg Konkuria to kill Sviatoslav before he reached Kiev. This was in line with the policy outlined by Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus and Administrandum Imperio of fomenting strife between the Rus and the Pechenegs. According to the Slavic Chronicle, Svanild attempted to warn Sviatoslav to avoid the Dnieper rapids, but the prince slighted his wise advice and was ambushed and slain by the Pechenegs when he tried to cross the cataracts near Kortitsa early in 972. The primary chronicle reports that his skull was made into a chalice by the Pechenegs. Condot following Sviatoslav's death, tensions between his sons grew. A war broke out between his legitimate sons, Oleg and Yeripok, in 976, at the conclusion of which Oleg was killed. In 977 Vladimir fled Novgorod to escape Oleg's fate and went to Scandinavia, where he raised an army of Varanians and returned in 980. Yeripok was killed, and Vladimir became the sole ruler of Kiev and Rus. Sviatoslav has long been a hero of Belarusian, Russian, and Ukrainian patriots due to his great military successes. His figure first attracted attention of Russian artists and poets during the Russo-Turkish War, 1768-1774 which provided obvious parallels with Sviatoslav's push towards Constantinople. Russia's southward expansion and the imperialistic ventures of Catherine II in the Balkans seem to have been legitimized by Sviatoslav's campaigns eight centuries earlier. Among the works created during the war was Yakov Nizhny's Tragedy Olga, 1772. The Russian playwright chose to introduce Sviatoslav as his protagonist, although his active participation in the events following Igor's death is out of sync with the traditional chronology. Nizhny's rival Nikolai Nikolaev, 1758-1815 also wrote a play on the subject of Sviatoslav's life. Ivan Akimov's painting Sviatoslav's return from the Danube to Kiev, 1773, explores the conflict between military honor and family attachment. 
It is a vivid example of Poussin-esque rendering of early medieval subject matter. Interest in Sviatoslav's career increased in the 19th century. Cliff G. Lebedev depicted an episode of Sviatoslav's meeting with Emperor John in his well-known painting, while Eugene Lancery sculpted an equestrian statue of Sviatoslav in the early 20th century. Sviatoslav appears in the 1913 poem of Elimir Klebnikov written before the war, number 70, as an epitome of militant Slavdom. Sviatoslav is the villain of the novel The Lost Kingdom, or The Passing of the Khazars, by Samuel Gordon, a fictionalized account of the destruction of Khazariya by the Rus. The Slavic warrior figures in a more positive context in the story Chernye Strelivyatisha by Vadim Viktorovich Kargilev, the story is included in his book Istorichesky Povesti. In 2005, reports circulated that a village in the Bielgorod region had erected a monument to Sviatoslav's victory over the Khazars by the Russian sculptor Vyacheslav Klikov. The reports described the 13-meter-tall statue as depicting a Rus cavalryman trampling a supine Khazar bearing a Star of David in Kolovrat. This created an outcry within the Jewish community of Russia. The controversy was further exacerbated by Klikov's connections with Pamiat and other anti-Semitic organizations, as well as by his involvement in the Letter of 500, a controversial appeal to the Prosecutor General to review all Jewish organizations in Russia for extremism. The press center of the Bielgorod Regional Administration responded by stating that a planned monument to Sviatoslav had not yet been constructed but would show respect towards representatives of all nationalities and religions. When the statue was unveiled, the shield bore a twelve-pointed star. Sviatoslav is the main character of the book Snyaz, and the hero, written by Russian writer Alexander Mazun. On November 7, 2011, a Ukrainian fisherman found a one-meter-long sword in the waters of the Dnieper on Kordytsia near where Sviatoslav is believed to have been killed in 972. The handle is made out of four different metals including gold and silver, and could possibly have belonged to Sviatoslav himself. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.